Hi, I'm Uri, and this is a joint work with Amos Bemel, Iftah Heitner, and Kobe Nisim about the round complexity of the shuffle model, and specifically, we are interested in the shuffle model in the context of differential privacy. So first, let me start with the definition of differential privacy. So it's a mathematical definition for privacy, saying the following. Let's think about a database that contains the information of individuals. So every row in this database contains the information of one individual. And we have an algorithm A that we want to apply to this database. So now let's think about the following mental experiment where we modify our database to what we call a neighboring database. And what it means is that all of the rows remain exactly the same, except that one of the rows in the database, let's say my row, we replace it with something completely different. So we have these two neighboring database, neighboring databases. Now we, we run the algorithm and what we require is that the outcome distribution of the algorithm remains roughly the same between whether we run it on the first or on the second, the second database. Formally, an algorithm is differentially private if for every two neighboring databases, S1 and S2, and for any possible event H, this event occurs with roughly the same probability between whether you run your algorithm on the first or on the second database. And this uh, similarity between the probabilities is quantified using these parameters, epsilon and delta. So that's the definition of differential privacy. Why do we like it? So um, the reason is that it has a, like, a very intuitive um, interpretation for privacy. Specifically, let's consider an adversary that knows all of the rows in the database, except for my row. And now we take this database and we run our algorithm on it. We get an outcome and we give this outcome to the adversary. Now this adversary from his point of view, he cannot learn basically anything about my row in the database because from his point of view, no matter what was my row in the database, he would have seen a sample from roughly the same distribution. So that's the intuitive uh, explanation of differential privacy. And also this definition, this definition satisfies uh, several useful, useful properties, which I'm not going to get into now. Okay, so that's the definition. And what I'll show you in this slide is um, kind of different models using which we can apply differential privacy in different settings. So the first model is called the centralized model for differential privacy. This is like the standard model. Uh, it uh, kind of fits the picture that I showed you in the previous slide. <clears throat> so we have a collection of N individuals, users, where each user has his own private data or input. Now, each of these users just give the, gives their data as is to a data curator. So the data curator now has a database uh, containing uh, information from these individuals. And now the data curator um, aggregates this database using differential privacy. So it runs a differentially private algorithm onto this database, obtains an outcome, and uh, publicly releases this uh, obtained outcome. So by the definition we uh, mentioned in the previous slide, we know that this outcome that the curator obtained here is, is really safe for publication in the sense that every attacker would see, would get to see this uh, obtained outcome, would learn uh, basically nothing about the data of every single individual uh, from here. So that's great. But the downside is that, as you see, the data curator, he learns everything. All of the users give their data as is to the data curator. What happens in cases where we don't want the curator to learn all of our, our data? So the first model that was considered in this uh, setting is called the local model of differential privacy. And in the local model of differential privacy, every user randomizes his data locally on his device using a differentially private algorithm and only sends the data curator the outcome of this differentially private outcome, which is already safe for publication. So in this model, even the data curator 
basically learns nothing about the data of every single individual because every um, single individual only sends the outcome of the differentially private algorithm on his data. And then the data curator uh, aggregates these um, noisy messages it gets from the users and computes whatever it wants to compute. To compute. So again, the data curator basically learns nothing about every single individual, which is great. But the downside is that because every user um, like adds a lots of lots of noise to his to its input, then accuracy is generally significantly reduced compared to what we can achieve in the centralized model of differential privacy. So um, this motivated the shuffle model of differential privacy in which we augment the local model of differential privacy with a special communication channel. We call it uh, a shuffle channel um, such that the following happens. In the shuffle model of differential privacy, like before, every user randomizes his input locally on his device and obtains a noisy message. And then all of the users submit their noisy messages to the uh, shuffle uh, channel. This channel randomly per permutes all of the messages it gets from the users and then gives the data curator these messages after the random permutation. So the hope is that this random permutation kind of disassociates the messages from the users who sent them. And then the hope is that because we have that, every user can add less noise to uh, his input before submitting it to the before submitting it to the shuffle. And therefore, hopefully, the database that the curator would get here at the end would uh, you, you, we could get a lot more utility out of it than what we can do in the local model of differential privacy. Okay, so that's informally uh, the shuffle model for differential privacy and the motivation for it. And here is the formal definition. Um, so we consider protocols that proceed in rounds, let's say R rounds, where in every round, every user submits L messages to the shuffle. So here in the picture, every user submits only one message, but let's, uh, but, but in general, we allow users to submit more than one message. So we have N users, each of them submitting L messages in every round. So in every round, we have overall N L messages. The shuffle randomly permutes all of these N L messages. And then everybody gets to see the outcome of the shuffle. And what we require is that the view of every coalition of up to T parties is differentially private in the sense that even after it gets to see the outcome of the shuffle, it learns basically nothing about the input of every user outside of this coalition. Okay, that's the definition of uh, the shuffle model. And recently there has been lots of works on the shuffle model uh, in the context of differential privacy. First, it was defined by uh, these guys in 2019. And then follow-up papers show that in many cases, we do really get significant uh, utility improvements over what we can obtain in the shuffle model of differential privacy. Sometimes we can even match, match what we can get uh, in, the, in, the, in the centralized model of differential privacy. Uh, for example, people considered problems like addition, histograms, and more. And also uh, several papers showed impossibility results for um, one round shuffle model protocols. And actually, um, this um, model was already defined outside uh, of the context of differential privacy in 2006 by Ishai et al. So they, they uh, presented and they defined and considered a similar model and um, in particular, they showed, uh, they showed that every finite functionality can be securely computed in this model, um, assuming an honest majority, using a constant number of rounds. Okay. Um, what we show in this work, um, so we studied the round complexity of 
uh, protocols in the shuffle model of differential privacy. We are the first to uh, formally um, or explicitly study the round complexity in the shuffle model. And specifically, what we show is first we present a generic result showing that any uh, functionality can be computed in two rounds if you have an honest majority. And also we present separations between what can be done using one and two rounds um, in the shuffle model. In more details, we show both positive and negative uh, results. First, we show uh, a protocol for secure message transmission in one round in the shuffle model. And I'll tell you more about this result in the next slides. And we use this result in order to uh, show a generic construction um, showing that any finite functionality can be computed if you have an honest majority using two rounds. Previously, what uh, was known using the uh, results of Ishai et al was three rounds. And as a corollary, um, this means that we can implement using two rounds in the shuffle model every centralized model DP functionality. Okay, so that's our generic construction. And we also show uh, separations between what can be done in one and two rounds. And specifically, to obtain our separa separations, we consider these two problems. The first, we call it the common element problem. And the second, we call it the nested common element problem. So for the common element problem, we show a lower bound on the message complexity of any one round protocol. Uh, informally, it says that if you want to solve this problem, the common element problem using one round, using a one round protocol in the shuffle model, then basically your message complexity cannot be constant. Uh, in contrast, we show that there is a two round protocol for this problem in the shuffle model in which the message complexity is one. Okay. Um, our second result, our second lower bound is for the nested common element problem. And for that problem, we show that there is no one round protocol that solves this problem, even if you assume that you have three quarter, a three quarters fraction of honest users. So this immediately implies a strong separation between one and two round protocols because by our generic construction, every functionality and in particular the nested common element problem can be solved in two rounds if you have an honest majority. Um, and uh, even for that specific problem, we design a specific uh, protocol that um, obtains better guarantees than our uh, generic construction, but even the generic construction immediately gives you a strong separation between one and two rounds. Okay, so that's our results. What I'll show you now um, is how do we construct a secure message transmi trans transmission in one round? So, um, before I'll show you how do we construct it, let's uh, do a quick recap and recall the definitions of key exchange and secure message transmission. Let's start with key exchange. So let's think about two users, user I and J, that uh, first submit messages to the shuffle, and then everybody gets to see the shuffled messages. Then user I and user J agree on a key, but all other users together even, they get no information on the key. So that's the definition of what we want from a key exchange protocol. The definition of secure message transmission is similar, but now user I, before we start, it has an input message M. Then users I and J, each of them submit messages to the shuffle, then everybody gets to see the outcome of the shuffle, then the requirement is that user J learns the message M, but all of the other users together, they get no information on the message M. Okay, so that's the definition of what we want 
uh, from a secure me message transmission protocol. And I'll just mention that Yishai et al, in their paper from 2006, they presented a key exchange protocol in the shuffle model that uses one round. And um, obviously, if you have a protocol for key exchange in one round, then you can use it in order to construct a secure message transmission protocol in two rounds, where in the first round, users I and J exchange a key. And then in the second round, user I sends the message to user J uh, privately after encrypting it using the key. What we show is a protocol for secure message transmission in one round. So let's see the details. But before I'll show you the um, protocol for secure message transmission, let's first see a, an easy protocol for key exchange. So it's a variant of the protocol of Ishai et al. And here is the protocol. So users I and J, each of them chooses a, a random bit. User I chooses a random bit A, user J chooses a random bit B, and they both send it to the shuffle. Now, if A is different than B, then the common key is A. Otherwise, the protocol fails. So why should that work? So first, both users I and J, they know the key. Why is that? User I knows A, he chose it. And user J knows B, so once, it's, once she sees the outcome of the shuffle, she learns A. Um, but all of the other users that see the outcome of the shuffle, with probability half, they see A comma B, and with probability half, they see B comma A. So they get no information on A, assuming that A and B are different. And so this means that users I and J, they agree on a key with probability half that nobody else knows. Great. What can we do if we want to agree on a key of uh, K bits? So we do something similar. But now each of the two users, instead of choosing just one bit, they choose a random um, 3K random bits. So user I chooses random bits A1, A2 till A3K. Uh, user J chooses random bits B1, B2, and so on. And they submit to the shuffle 1 comma A1, 2 comma A2, and so on. And user J submits to the shuffle 1 comma B1, 2 comma B2, and so on. So um, we expect that on half of the coordinates, we will get that AI is different than BI. And with high probability, uh, we will have at least K such indices. So after seeing the outcome of the, sh the shuffle, we denote by I the, the first K indices sh such that AI is different than BI. And the common key is the AIs from this uh, set of indices. Okay, so um, this is a simple protocol that allows these two users to agree on a secret key with high probability and the keys of length K. Great. Um, so once we have a protocol for key exchange, then Yishai et al observed that we can use it in order to, um, to implement secure computation in the shuffle model. How? We use, a, we, we use uh, one extra round in order to use the key exchange protocol in order to uh, exchange keys and therefore um, um, create private channels. And then we apply an existing MPC protocol after we have private channels. So a corollary of that, if you combine this idea with the secure two round protocol of Applebaum et al, then what you get is a, is a generic secure computation in the shuffle model that uses three rounds. Okay. So what I'll show you now is a different key exchange protocol in which one of the two parties knows the key 
in advance. So here's the protocol. Now, each of the two users uh, chooses a collection of 7K random bits. So user I chooses A1, A2, and so on. User J chooses B1, B2, and so on. And like before, they submit to the shuffle 1, comma, A1, 2, comma, A2, and so on, and likewise here. Now, for a hash function H that maps 7K bits to K bits, the common key is H applied to the collection of the random bits AI. So observe that user I knows the key in advance. So why should that work? So first, user I knows the key, uh, and also user J, after seeing the outcome of the shuffle, it learns the AIs and therefore learns the key. But all of the other users in places where AI is different than BI do not learn the ith bit of the key. So we expect them to learn um, half of the bits, so 3.5K bits we expect them to learn. And with high probability, all of the other users know less than 4K of the bits uh, from the AIs. So by the leftover hash lemma, this means that H applied to the AIs remains close to uniform even when the other users know 4K of these bits AI. So this means that users I and J agree on a key, user I knew the key in advance, and all of the other users basically learned nothing about the key. So um, this means that we can implement general MPC in the shuffle model without increasing the round, co the round complexity. Specifically, uh, using the Apple Baum et al protocol, we can implement it in two rounds because during the first round, we both exchange keys and send the messages required uh, that we are requ required to send uh, by the ABT protocol in the first round. And then for the second round, we have secure channels. So to conclude, what we present is a generic MPC result showing that any finite functionality can be computed using two rounds, assuming an honest majority in the semi-honest setting. Um, in particular, this means that any uh, centralized model DP functionality can be computed in the shuffle model using two rounds. And we present impossibility results for one round protocols that gives separations between what can you do in one and in two rounds. And that's it.